Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word. Our Father is coming down here in this great book of Jeremiah in this 48th chapter on the Gentile nations. And basically many of them are the same nations that are swarming today. So you want to pay very close attention. Remember, our Father tells us in Ecclesiastes what goes around comes around, meaning these things happened in the original so that you would know what would befall you in the end times. So even though it's Old Testament, it's prophecy. Prophecy is future. And you have an example of what the future will tell you when you absorb and understand the Word of God. We're addressing Moab now. Moab means of his own father, which was one of uh, Lot's sons by one of his own daughters after Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. And they refused, as um, you noticed in verse 27 of this 48th chapter, of Israel to pass through. That upset our father terribly, that one of your own kind would turn you down. He frowns on that highly. Therefore, it's something you want to make note of. And as we continue then, as God expresses his feelings toward Moab, I want, I want to instill one thing in your mind. Many people say, well, he condemned the Moabites forever, not just the males, not the females. That's why that Ruth, being a Moabitist, was even in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. No problem with the scripture when you properly understand. So, chapter 48, verse 34, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, from this having to do with Moab. From the cry of Heshbon, that's to say your stronghold, even unto Elielah, and even unto Jahaz. Elielah is an interesting word. It means the ascension of El, or the ascension of God, or the coming down of God. So there you kind of have a time sequence, the second advent, okay? Jahaz, of course, means the trotting down, or trodden down. Have they uttered their voice from Zoar, that means smallness, even unto Horonim, and um, that's twin caverns, a place of worship for them, as an heifer of three years old, meaning they can't defend themselves. She's gentle, but j just push them around wherever you want to. For the waters also of Nimrim, which should be pure, shall be desolate, meaning by what? The desolator. Uh, when, when the coming down of our Father, the ascension of Almighty God on this scene, hey, he's not happy. And when his children go against him in this respect, he notices it. Verse 35, Moreover, I will cause to cease in Moab, saith the Lord, him that offereth in the high places and him that burneth incense to his gods. You will note the word gods there is in the lower case, meaning his idols. Um, and so his high places, of course, he practiced Moalachism, meaning burning uh, sacrifices. Uh, unfortunately, live ones, 36 children mainly. 36, therefore mine heart shall sound for Moab like pipes. And, um, and mine heart shall sound like pipes. Do you know what kind of pipes these are in the Hebrew tongue? Funeral pipes. Giving you the real mood of our father here. I'm going to blow some funeral pipes for him. For the men of Kerheris. Um, and um, that's just, the, again, that fortress because of the riches that he hath gotten and are perished. It doesn't amount to anything, things of this world, when it comes to our Father's um, uh, interceding and bringing upon your head what you deserve. 
37. For every head shall be bald, and every beard clipped. It's going to be shaped. Upon all the hands shall be cuttings, and upon the loins sackcloth. Your little false religions and praying to your little idols and so forth is not going to help you one iota. There's only one God. That's our Father, Yahweh. And certainly, um, he being the creator of all souls and all souls belonging to him, as it's written in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, I own all souls. You don't get around to giving your soul to God. He's already got it. It's his to do with as you deserve. That's why you always get what you got coming to you. Verse 38. There shall be lamentation, a lot of sadness, a lot of crying, generally upon all the housetops of Moab, right up where the watchmen are supposed to be, a lot of tears shed. For I have broken Moab like a vessel wherein is no pleasure, saith the Lord. In other words, um, you can tell he's very angry. And um, uh, naturally, unfortunately, when the old pot breaks, that means you're deceased. Verse 39. They shall howl, saying, How is it broken down? How hath Moab turned the back with shame? So shall Moab be a derision and a dismaying to all them about him. A laughing stock. They'll laugh at him. This is why you want to always realize Christianity is a reality, not a religion. Follow God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And make sure you're not in that lot that is laughed at for silliness. And you might say, well, how, how, what, what are you talking about? What, what making Ishtar, the little pagan goddess of fertility, into your Christian religion? In part, that's not very wise. Verse 40. For thus saith the Lord, behold, he shall fly as an eagle and shall spread his wings over Moab. Who is this he here? Well, it's the king of Babylon. In, in, in history, it was Nebuchadnezzar. What is it in the future sense? The king of Babylon in the book of Revelation is nothing but the false Christ himself. He's going to fly like an eagle. He's going to cover everywhere. And many people will be deceived by him. And so it is. It is written. That's how it will come to pass. It happened that way historically, and in the future sense, it'll go down the same way as it's written in the great book of Revelation. Verse 41. Uh, Kuroth, that's to say cities, is taken, all of them, and the strongholds are surprised, and the mighty men's hearts in Moab at that day shall be as the heart of a woman in her pains, meaning at labor pains. The, closer and closer until you have the birth of a new age. So we're talking future here, you bet. <clears throat> it's talking about the end of this particular dispensation of time. Again, our Father is not happy with those of his own kind that turn on his own kind. That's what Moab did, as it's written and recorded back in the 27th verse of this same chapter. Verse 42, And Moab shall be destroyed from being a people, because he hath magnified himself against the Lord. And certainly anyone in Moab that becomes a Christian, a Christ man, in this generation, or any generation in, in this dispensation of time, becoming Christian, overrides that. And, uh, but why would they cease being a people? Because at this time, when God ascends, when he comes back down, when he takes over, there's only going to be one nation. For he is king of kings and lord of lords. Therefore, all nations shall cease to exist and will come under the heading of only one. That's headed by our father, verse 43. Fear and the pit and the snare shall be upon thee, O inhabitant of Moab, saith the Lord. In other words, uh, fear is to dread what's coming. The pit is a trap, and 
that you fall into in a snare is a loop set to catch you if you get out. 44 explaining, He that fleeth from the fear shall fall into the pit, and he that getteth up out of the pit shall be taken in the snare, for I will bring, this is God emphatically speaking, I will bring upon it, even upon Moab, the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. And that year of visitation is going to come. The year of the visitation is the year of, the year of recompense, the year of vengeance, God's vengeance. The cup will be poured out. Well, what cup is that? The wrath of God. It's going to be poured out. You can count on it. Verse 45, they that fled stood under the shadow of Heshbon. That's a brick fortress, stronghold. Should be safe there because of the forest, but a fire shall come forth out of Heshbon, out of the fort itself, and a flame from the midst of Sihon, that's to say the warrior, even the warrior will have the flame, and shall devour the corner of Moab and the crown of the head of the tumultuous ones. The tumultuous ones is the children of noise, those that swarm and make a great noise and absolutely have no intelligence whatsoever among the whole lot, as they swarm like a swarm of locusts in the end times. And so it is. What, what God is saying here, you can't hide from me on that time. There's no stronghold, no brick fortress. Nothing's going to protect you. When it comes time for me to make the record straight, it will happen. Verse 46, Woe be unto thee, O Moab, the people of Chumash, um, and that's uh, perisheth. That, Chumash, Chumash, Chumash is the subduer. Okay. For thy sons are taken captives, and thy daughters captives. By who? By the subduer. By he that was, he promised would fly like an eagle, the king of Babylon. None other than the false Christ himself. 47. Yet will I bring again the captivity of Moab. In the latter days, saith the Lord, thus far is the judgment of Moab. Again, if, if one switches and is in Christ... The sins of the nation do not fall upon that one. On repentance, they're totally clear, and as a Christian, have salvation. But at the same time, don't miss the historical count here that is yet prophecy of what is to come in the future at the return of Almighty God. Those that practice false religion, which these people had a real bad one, it was Molochism, that's burning your own kids, uh, sacrificing them to God to please him. That's, that God never, he never even came in, never did it come into God's mind to have you offer children in the fire. That's strictly paganism. God's not happy about it. Okay, chapter 49, verse 1. That has to do with Moab. Now we go with the Ammonites, that's to say his brother. And verse 1, with that word of wisdom, it reads, Concerning the Ammonites, thus saith the Lord, Hath Israel no sons? Question. Hath he no heir? Why then doth their king inherit Gad? And his people dwell in his cities. Let's check this out a little bit. Gad was one of the tribes of Jacob. And uh, what, but first, if you didn't understand from the Hebrew manuscripts, this word king, it's Malcolm or Moloch, that, uh, that uh, fire god. So doesn't, doesn't God have his own children to inherit the blessings of Almighty God? You're trying to rip them off? Verse 2, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will cause an alarm of war to be heard in Rabbi, that's just the, the great of the Ammonites, the great and powerful place, they call it, and it shall be a desolate heap. And her daughters, that's to say the smaller 
little allies and out uh, cities shall be burned with fire. Then shall Israel be heir unto them that were his heirs, saith the Lord. Those that do right and in following God shall inherit from Almighty God. Not, not somebody practicing false religion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not somebody burning their children to a fake God because of false religion, false teachings. The traditions of man make void the word of God if you're not very careful. You must analyze what our father said in the simplicity in which he said it, not to be confused nor complicated by man's changing or instilling for himself certain rites and rituals that God didn't come into God's mind. It's real easy to discern, determine. All you have to do is read God's word. Verse 3. Hal O Heshbarn, that old stronghold you got there, for Ai, Ai means a heap of ruin, is spoiled. You cry, ye daughters of Rabbi, that's to say the great. Gird you with sackcloth, lament, you better get tears flowing. And run to and fro by the hedges, by the very border itself. For their king shall go into captivity. Well, who, who is that king again? I just told you. The Hebrew manuscripts make it clear. It's Malcolm, Moloch, and his priest and his princes together. The whole church system that follows that ilk, false teaching, misleading the people. Verse 4, Wherefore glorious thou in the valleys? What are you celebrating about? Thy flowing valley, O backsliding heifer, daughter, that trusteth in her treasures, saying, Who shall come unto me? We are so strong, who could possibly hurt us? Uh, we, we have owned and we do own the world. Nobody can bother us. We're in, and uh, certainly, why, why do they do? They discount God. They don't believe in God, the true Father. He can quite well reach them anytime, anywhere. Verse 5. Behold, I will bring a fear upon thee. It's coming, saith the Lord God of hosts, from all those that be about thee, and ye shall be driven out every man right forth, and none shall gather up him that wandereth. Nobody's going to go out looking for strays. Verse 6, And afterward I will bring again the captivity of the children of Ammon, saith the Lord. Why? Those, that, those that convert to Christianity in the future sense. Whomsoever will, will accept of the living God. This being God's word in the future sense to those nations, and unfortunately, those that would turn on uh, the very word of God. Now, we come to a different people. Let's pick it up in verse 7 and go with it. Concerning Edom, thus saith the Lord of hosts, is wisdom no more in Teman, that means South Edom? Is counsel perished from the prudent? Is their wisdom vanished? Now, let's identify this people. Eden, of course, what, what does, what does um, Eden mean in the Hebrew tongue? It means red. What, what is the red nation? Well, it's the nation of Esau. Way back in Genesis chapter 27, God promised Esau that, uh, that he would live off away from the fat of the land, though it's translated fat, meaning uh, what, what where do we find who these people are now then? 38th chapter of Ezekiel, the chief prince of Meshach. Teman is South Russia. Okay. Uh, Meshach, and the chief in the Hebrew manuscripts is Rosh, R-O-S-H. By the Volga, it was later turned to R-U-S-S, -S, and today we call it Russia. Well, how, how is it that uh, all counsel and wisdom has left them? Well, what does, a communist, what does communism first do? 
they try to drive out God from your vocabulary. They close down all churches. They drive God totally out of existence. They basically murder and kill or drive away people that are independent thinking people that love God. This, this is not to say that people of this nation that convert to Christianity, they, they do it the hard way, my friend. It wasn't too many years ago to be baptized in Russia, you had to go in the dark cutting through maybe two foot of ice to be baptized. I wonder how many American Christians would want to be baptized well enough to go to that extent. But yet, where, where, why is wisdom no longer there? I, I remember seeing a beautiful potato crop being gathered, and the people are digging with shovels in this field, and here's this big, beautiful tractor with a flat on it. That could have, with a plow that would turn that ground and they could have produced 20 times what they were able to, the same people doing. But there wasn't anybody there that knew how to fix the flat on the tractor. Why? All people that were intelligent were murdered, driven away. And there sit the big piece of equipment with a flat and the people digging the hard way with shovels to gather a crop. Wisdom gone, you bet. There's nothing wise about that. It makes one sad to even think about it. But this is why that Timon being the south of Rush, and, uh, and again, I want to say so that you can document it for yourself, all you have to do is take your Strong's Concordance, go to Ezekiel chapter 38, where it says, Chief Prince Meshach. Take either the word chief or prince, Check it back to the Hebrew, and it is R-O-S-H. And it is that hairy one, Esau, which is the nation, Russia, of today. Verse 8, to continue, and these, these prophecies are against that nation. So now you're centered in, we're going against Russia now. Verse, not the people necessarily, but the communistic way, socialistic way. And so it is. Verse 8, Flee ye and turn back. Dwell deep, O inhabitants of Dedan, for I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him the time that I will visit him. In other words, um, you better dwell and dig you a deep hole. But it's, there's going to be calamity there, and God intends to visit. They're going to find out there's a God. Well, how do you know that? Well, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 tell you. There's going to be a war. You know, we purchased Alaska from Russia. Made a, made a really a good deal. But then it is written that they shall come into our country, which is now Rush, which is Alaska, in a valley that is not even inhabited. And God will strike that army down. It's called Hemengog in the Hebrew tongue. God will strike that army down. We will not fire a shot. It is written. Well, why won't God let us fire a shot? For a very simple reason. They don't believe there's a God. And boy, are they going to find out the hard way. That's why God wants to destroy them so they know he's real. And he's ticked at those that would drive out the name of our Heavenly Father from their midst and rob a people of eternal salvation. Verse 9, continuing concerning this nation. If great gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some gleaming grapes? They would, they'd leave a few. If thieves by night, they will destroy till they have enough. Even they would only take what they can carry or need. But he's saying, you, you do worse than that. You take everything. You rip everything away from people. Their belief, their faith. Verse 10. But I have made Esau bare. I'm, I'm going to scrap it. I have uncovered his secret places. And he shall not be able to hide himself. 
his seed is spoiled, and his brethren and his neighbors, and he is not. It's just not going to exist anymore. Now, that may sound really super final, be me, but always remember what happens at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There will be no other nations. They will no longer exist because you will either come under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ or you won't be. King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Verse 11, back to Rush. Leave thy fatherless children, I will, pre uh, I will preserve them alive, and let thy widows trust in me. Don't try to drive my name out. Verse 12, For thus saith the Lord, Behold, they whose judgment was not to drink of the cup have assuredly drunken, and art thou he that shall altogether go unpunished? Thou shalt not go unpunished, but thou shalt surely drink of it. This is that cup on the night that Christ was just before his crucifixion where he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he asked the Father, is it possible this cup could pass from me? And many people think, well, he, he was talking about the crucifixion. He wanted out from under that. That's, that's false. He, he knew that he, he was to be offered up. He was well, very well aware of that. But he knew at his return that that cup of wrath would be poured out and it would be a bitter pill on many people. That's God's wrath. And, and then Jesus would say, Not my will but yours, Father. And Father would not let that cup go. That cup is going to be poured out. It's the seven vials mentioned in the great book of Revelation. And don't think that a vial is some little petty um, perfume bottle. It is a short, flat, wide mouth vessel, and when it's dumped, it all goes at the same time. That's God's wrath. It's going to happen. He said, you're not going to be unpunished. You're going to get what you got coming to you. They're going to find out there is a God in heaven. Verse 13, For I have sworn by myself, saith the Lord, that Basra, your fortress, shall become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, and a curse, and all the cities thereof shall be perpetual waste. It's, you're not going to rebuild it. It is, it is um, that is to say, anything that is socialistic, Anything that is communistic will no longer exist. That is not my word. That is not the word of some politician. It's the word of the living God. Why? Well, we, again, we all come under one title. King of kings, Lord of lords, like it or lump it. Verse 14. I have heard a rumor from the Lord... And an ambassador is sent unto the heathen, saying, Gather ye together, and come against her, and rise up to the battle. Um, and, and so it is. Uh, try, you want to try to come back to y'all. You better stand up, and you better fight. 15. For lo, I will make thee small among the heathen and despised among men. This is atheism. Those that, the communistic atheism that would drive God out is hated by men. There is no future. Verse 16, The terribleness hath deceived thee, thy terribleness hath deceived thee, and the pride of thine heart O thou that dwellest in the cliffs of the rock, um, that holdest the height of the hill, though thou shouldest make thy nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. In other words, if you're in a superposition, even it doesn't matter. I know I've got your number. 
I know where you're at. Sila is the rock, is Petra, and uh, in the Hebrew tongue. I think that would say a lot to some. But God knows where all the enemies are that go against him. Again, as I stated earlier in the lecture, in Ezekiel chapter 18, 4, all souls belong to God. Every atheist, every communist, every socialist, every individual, their souls already belong to God. They're his to do with as he chooses. Now, if you make your little petty mind up that man doesn't need God because there is no God, and yet God owns you, what do you think he's going to do to you? Do you think for one moment where this beautiful eternal heaven comes to pass that we would want you there? Or let me ask it a little different way. If you curse God and disbelieve in him, do you think he would want you there? We don't want you there, and he doesn't want you there. So unless you change, you're in a heap of hurt, friend. Sometimes, um, you know, I've, I've lived many years, and I've known a few atheists, and they like to spar with a person that really knows God's word. They truly do. They love to spar with somebody that knows their business. And I've known many of them that just as many, some of them even on their deathbed would come to me and say, pray for me. Pray for me. So, uh, you know, God knows I don't, and no one else should judge anyone. But what a terrible waste of a human soul is not to accept the love and the leading of Almighty God, regardless of what nation you're in. When God loves all of his children, but certainly he will not put up with those that will deny him and that will harm the innocent that do love him. You're in a heap of hurt. And I don't have to tell you that. You should be able to feel it. Okay, we'll pick this up in the next lecture. Don't miss it. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. All right, there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. Our Father is the judge. We don't have to judge. It is true that you should teach God's word as it is written and never apologize for it. Let the chips fall where they may. Our Father loves his word to be taught honestly as best you can. Those of you that listen around the world by shortwave, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you a mailing address. Again, it's always a pleasure. Now, got a prayer request? You don't need that number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. You don't even have to say it out loud. He hears you. He reads your mind. Cardio nor in the Greek tongue. So talk to him. What does he want from you? Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I want your love, not your burnt offerings. That's to say your mercy. That's what he wants from you. So let him know that you love him. You should for all that he has done for us. Father, around the globe we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, 
touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with um, uh, Sherry from Pennsylvania. Does the first seal, vial, and trump happen at the same time and so on through the seventh seal, vial, and trump? No, no, no. No, they don't. As a matter of fact, the first seal is the appearance of a great white horse with a great man riding him. Only it's not the true Christ, it's the fake. Why? Because the seals go into your mind, meaning the first step of knowledge in understanding the seven trumps, seven seals, and seven vows is to know the Antichrist comes first. But when you get to the sixth seal, the sixth trump, and the sixth vial, that's six, 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 that's Satan's number, then no, they do um, line up effectively one with the other. Why is it called the hour of temptation when the tribulation is a five-month period? Well, well, you want to read Revelation chapter 17, verse 12, and it will let you know that the false Christ with his certain, his ten heavenly kings he brings with him, not the earthly kings, will have one hour, and it's called the hour of temptation. However, it is five, it is a five-month period. But it, through that, that whole time, it is a time people can be tempted to worship him. Why? Because he puts on quite a show. And um, he brings a lot of blessings to those that will worship him. And he is tempting except to God's elect. And we find him to be an abomination. Uh, Danny from Illinois. What will happen first? The two witnesses getting killed or the elect being letting the Holy Spirit speak through them? The elect letting the Holy Spirit speak through them. Why, well, how can you say that? Well... The two witnesses, as it is written in Revelation chapter 11, when they are killed in this place in the Greek tongue called the Pata, it's an arena, not a street, they're having a party, and they kill the two witnesses, and exactly three days and a half later, the Lord Jesus Christ returns, meaning that when you see, and you will, in this generation, when you see those two witnesses die in that arena, then you will know at that time when the end is because it will be exactly three and a half days later that the true Christ will return and those witnesses will ascend back to life. And in the Greek it's called epipeto, which means a paralyzing fear comes over the people at that time when they see those witnesses rise from that street. What a time that's going to be, and it's coming, it's soon. Dana from Michigan, does God have a name, and if so, what is it? Well, well, when Moses went up on Mount Sinai and received all the words, he said, hey, who, who am I going to say sent me? You know, he said, I, I, I want to give him a name. And God said, you tell them I am that I am. And tell them, Yah, Y-A-H, sent you. And naturally, from this I am that I am, in the Hebrew tongue, is Iyah Asha which makes up the etymology and also the consonants, Y-H-V-H. And from this, we know we have the sacred name, and his sacred name is Yahweh. Now, uh, there would be quite a bit there that could be changed a fraction except for one thing. Our God is, our Father is always real good to us. In the book of Esther as well as in the book of Psalms, the sacred name is hidden. In the book of Esther, it's hidden five times and spelled out in an acrostic five times, four times as Yahweh, and once as I am that I am, so that you cannot miss the value of the sacred name. Many might wonder, well, why do you say Yahweh instead of Yahweh? 
because of the scripture locking in the sacred name and the V, the V, V, comes from the word and in the Hebrew tongue, which is V, not W. So the correct pronunciation is there for whomsoever will. Has the, cares to take the time to study God's word and check it out yourself. I have a paper on that even, and and uh, so so be it. You find it in your you with companion Bibles. You're blessed because in the acrostics it lays it out for you in English, where anyone a child can understand. Joel from I don't know where Joel's from. Why is it written in the Bible that we are to hate our kin? You know, there are many misunderstandings because of translations. You're referencing Luke chapter 14, verse 26. And what it says is, if you're going to follow me, Christ speaking, if you're going to follow me, and bear in mind, that was a pretty hard trip back at that time. They didn't have transportation like we do today and so forth. He said, you have to, it is true, it is translated, you have to hate your mother, brother, father, but the word in the Greek is love less. He does not tell you that you must hate your family. He said, you must love them less than me. To follow me, to pick up your cross and be willing to carry it, do you know why you pick up a cross? To be crucified on. In other words, God was saying through the Son, you, you have, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to teach my word, if you're going to follow me, you've got to be able to put it all on the line yeah, by loving me more than your family. It doesn't mean, again, that you, and you should love God more than your family. You should love the Savior more than your family because he doesn't only save you, he saves your whole family that will believe. And, you know, that's the beauty of a true man or woman of God. Their heart is able to love if they will, if they let it. And you don't have to replace somebody to love somebody. Your heart is big enough that you can make room. Uh, Brenda, for, uh, love less. That's what it means, not hate. Check it out in your Strong's Concordance. It's real easy. Brenda from Texas, is it wrong to read the Bible on the computer? No, absolutely not. Uh, we, the BibleSoft program that we carry that assists you in, by computer being able to locate scriptures or, or um, definitions in the Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic um, is, is a blessing. So it's, it's a tool. You know, Father gave us a mind, and he expects us to use that mind, and uh, the computer is only a tool. It does not uh, sway you, and it should not, and never should you allow it to teach you how to think. But studying God's Word will never do you any harm if you'll stick strictly to the Word of God. Shirley from Wisconsin. When we die... Do we go straight to heaven, or do we stay in the ground until Jesus comes back to take us to heaven? Well, what does the Bible say? New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, to be absent from this flesh body is to be present with the Lord. He owns your soul, and, and, and as it would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, don't be ignorant of the fact that you've got two bodies. You've got this flesh body, which is your home here in, on earth, but within it you also have a spiritual body. Quite frankly, it's your real body. It was your body you had in even the first earth age. And what does the Bible say? And listen to me very carefully. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. It states that when this clay pot breaks, means your old ticker quits and you are just I mean you kick the bucket there's no other word for it when, and uh, that silver cord part meaning you're going to break contact with this meat this flesh and you're going to return to the father instantly and this dirt which is to say your flesh goes back to the dirt from which it came you, you're through with it you don't need you have a you have a spiritual body that doesn't get sick it does not get old. It doesn't get crippled up 
why would you want this thing back? Okay. You don't. It's gone. And you go into your real body, which is um, eternal if you love the Lord Jesus Christ. Victoria from Connecticut. Uh, please explain 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. You cannot explain chapter 4, verses 16 and 17 without going back to verse 13 and 14 to pick up the subject. Meaning, if you don't go back and pick up the subject, you're not going to know what it's talking about. Therefore, it wouldn't make any sense to you. You might even make a rapture out of it. So, go back to 13 and 14. What does it say? Don't be ignorant like the heathen are. If you believe Christ rose from the dead in his spiritual body, naturally he was transfigured both, then you want to believe and know that all that sleep in him, that is to say that are dead, are, have risen also. They're already gone. There is no way it will continue on then that we who are alive and remain can precede them. Because the dead must resurrect first. Why? They're already gone. You cannot go back before they do because they're already there. It's that simple. A child can understand that. And then we pick it up in 16 and 17. At the last trump, that's the seventh one, all of us are changed into spiritual bodies. The word air there, meet them in the air, isn't atmosphere, it isn't sky, it's breath. <sighs> breath of life, body, meaning spiritual body. We meet them. So therefore, then you can better understand verse 16 and 17 without somebody making some flyaway doctrine out of it. It simply means those that are already passed on are with the Father, and at the seventh trump, the rest of us will join them. Linda from Tennessee, where can I find in the Bible where God shortened the time from seven years to five months? Revelation chapter 9. You, you get the... You get the um, thought first from Mark chapter 13 is an example where God says through the Son, hey, the Antichrist is sharp enough, if I, didn't, if, if I were not to shorten the time, even the elect would be deceived. That kind of lets you know what we're kind of up against. It doesn't shake us, it doesn't bother us, but because for our sake he shortened, he said for the elect's sake I have shortened it. That's, that's Mark chapter 13. And then in Revelation chapter 9, you know that he not only shortened it to five months, but he lets you know it's the five-month stage of the locust when they swarm. From May through September, that's a five-month period. Rebecca from Montana. Where can I find China in the Bible? Well, usually it's referred to as the men of the East. Uh, I'll tell you how... One question, one scripture I've quoted from quite a bit today, Ezekiel chapter 38, concerning the final battle. The men of the East, uh, referred to in that chapter, is China. Lee from Virginia, if you are divorced, is it okay to remarry in God's eyes? You know, this, uh, does Christ forgive sin? And the answer, yes, Christ forgives sins. Is divorce the unpardonable sin? The answer is no. Divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Then if someone sins where they create or cause a divorce, and if they repent honestly before God and ask forgiveness, and Christ forgives them, are they free of sin? The answer is, of course. You wouldn't be a Christian if you didn't know and understand that. Then certainly, um, once, this is the beauty of Christianity, don't ever let anyone take that away from you. That you always have that start of forgiveness of sin. Now, I know that many people in reading the scripture, if you marry, if you marry again, then you're, you're an adulteress. Well, in the second place, adultery is not the unpardonable sin. But it doesn't, Christ didn't say, and which you should be able to figure yourself, if you repent, you're not guilty of the sin. And furthermore, there are biblical reasons for divorce. 
And certainly that person can doesn't even have to repent to remarry. Okay, so anyway, um, it's, it's, it is no, I don't know anyone that is perfect. Therefore, I think if two have divorced, it probably there's blame in both places. Maybe more so in one than the other. But if I were in that position, and I'm not, because I've never been divorced, but I would still repent just in case I had had a part in it, you know, and, and, and be asked forgiveness. It's not the unpardonable sin. God made man and woman for each other. Go in peace, repentant and loving Almighty God. Daniel from Illinois. What is the deadly wound? What was Satan's name before the rebellion? Well, in, in the first earth age, he was called the king of Tyrus, which means rock in the Hebrew tongue. He was the king of the rock. Not our rock, okay. And you can read of that in Ezekiel chapter 28. It tells what, how he worked himself up to be the cherub that protecteth. And then he fell. And that brought about the destruction of the first earth age. Uh, the deadly wound itself is quite easy to understand because you, you ask, well, who receives the deadly wound? The political beast. Well, how does a political beast then receive a deadly wound? Well, it isn't to a person, it's to a political system called one worldism. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, it receives a deadly wound because there is almost we have a one world political system that comes together peacefully and then it blows up. Well, I don't think it's too difficult today to understand how that can happen, politically speaking something almost coming together and then it just dissipates. But then the Antichrist appears on the scene and makes it real well and everything goes good because he offers a chicken in every pot and freedom for everybody. And most of the world will be deceived enough to go along with it. Susan from Florida, I would like to know about the three earth ages. Um, is the teaching part of the millennium part of the second earth age or the third? Please explain. Thank you. Well, the, certainly the millennium is not part of the third earth age. But be very careful how you would say which part. It is a different dimension because we're all in spiritual bodies, a different dimension. But it is called the Lord's Day. It is a specific period of time set aside between the second and the third earth ages, and it is known as the Lord's Day. Don't take away from that. Well, what does it mean then? Second Peter chapter 3, what is it, verse 7 or 8? Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years with man. In other words, it's a millennium. The Lord's Day is a thousand years long, and it is a period for God to take people that were handicapped and could not quite reason what was happening because of handicap or a person that never heard the word, the real truth. It is a time for to make certain that everyone totally and completely understands. Then Satan is released a short season if they did not take part in the first resurrection then they can earn the right then. It is the equalizer of God on the Lord's day. What a precious father we have that he does this. That's not a second chance because there's a lot of people in this world today that don't have a prayer of a chance because of what is taught. Jimmy from Ohio. Every chance I get, I tell everybody the Antichrist comes first. Is it okay to do this? Well, it's okay, but protect your credibility you know, you don't, um, you, you always say that in a position where someone has asked or brings the subject up, and then don't hammer it. You're fishing. You just pass that bait out there and just jiggle it a little bit. Don't throw the anchor at them or hit them with an oar, okay? Just be real gentle. Protect your credibility. Fish for men. Uh, David uh, from Virginia, which chapter of the Bible says who goes first? <clears throat> I think, 
I think probably you're thinking about two working in the field and one is taken and one is left, or two men are in a bed, one is taken and one is left. I, I'm going to guess that that's what you're talking about. What, again, always go back to the subject. Then you know what you're talking about. Let's take the case in uh, Matthew 24 where it makes it very clear that the Antichrist is coming first. And they're going to tell you he's out in the field. Don't believe it. Don't go. And then it lets you know there'll be two and one will be taken and one left. The one that's taken is taken by Antichrist. So the first one taken is taken by Antichrist. Because he comes at the sixth trump. The true Christ doesn't come until the seventh. That's biblical. It is written. It is so. So, uh, naturally, the first one taken is taken by Antichrist. And you know, I've heard, in my lifetime, I've heard preachers say, I want to be the first one taken. I want to make that trip. And in ignorance of not knowing, we're talking Antichrist deception. So that, that's the way you figure that out, okay? You get the subject, which is Antichrist comes first, and go from that. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it, okay? It's a letter he sent to you telling you how things are in these end times and what you should do about it, how you should react. And um, you make his day when you let him know you love him in covering that letter he sent to you. We, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you listen to me and listen good. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day. You know why? Even with trouble, because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736.